The rocket was real, the launch window unforgiving, and the destination, the moon, was over 380,000 kilometers, nearly 240,000 miles away, a silent, hostile expanse. In the summer of 1969, the world watched a feat of engineering the size of the Saturn V rocket itself. 110 meters, 363 feet of liquid-fueled defiance, generating 34 meganewtons, 7.6 million pounds of thrust. It was a machine of awe, designed to deliver three men to history. But the real crucible of the Apollo program was not the launch pad. It was not the cold vacuum of space. The true test of will and machine was conducted again and again in a network of simulator rooms, separated by hundreds of kilometers, miles, from the Kennedy launch site. This is the story of Apollo 11's secret rehearsal, the story of the men and the machines that pushed humanity to the brink of spaceflight without ever leaving the ground. It is the story of NASA's simulators, not as mere teaching tools, but as rigorous instruments of psychological and technical perfection. By the time Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins boarded the command module Columbia in July 1969, they had collectively spent thousands of hours inside their highly accurate training devices. They needed to. Apollo was a choreography of two separate, impossibly complex spacecraft, the Command and Service Module, CSM, Columbia, and the lunar module, LM, Eagle. Each had its own personality, operating system, and list of potential failures. The simulators embodied an engineering philosophy that treated Murphy's Law as scripture. If anything can go wrong, it will. Their purpose was explicit to expose every flaw in human readiness and machine design before the real flight. Simulations were designed, as one engineer said, to push the crew and systems to the edge. The Command Module Simulator, CMS, and the Lunar Module Simulator, LMS, were among the most advanced training devices ever built. Housed at the Manned Spacecraft Center in Houston, these room-sized replicas were connected to vast networks of analog and digital computers, capable of reproducing every system the astronauts would encounter in flight. Let's begin with the Command Module Simulator, the domain of Michael Collins, who would remain in lunar orbit, the crucial link for his crewmate's safe return. The CMS was a meticulously crafted replica of the Columbia's interior. The real Command Module's cabin was about 3.9 meters, 12 feet 10 inches in diameter and its main instrument panel spanned more than 2.3 meters, or approximately 90 inches, across, bristling with over 500 switches, circuit breakers, and gauges. Each control had to be positioned as expected. Every indicator had to behave as it would under the stresses of launch and the isolation of translunar flight. To achieve this realism, the CMS was linked to a building-sized computer complex consisting of IBM mainframes and custom analog systems. This system didn't simply generate numbers, it modeled real-time orbital mechanics, fluid dynamics of onboard systems, and the precise electrical load of every switch thrown. 
If Collins initiated an SPS burn, the simulator instantly calculated the change in velocity, updating the visual cues of apparent star fields outside. The feedback loop between crew actions and real-time simulation honed instinctive reactions. Engineers controlling the simulation could trigger cascading and contradictory failures, such as a loss of fuel pressure, followed by erratic attitude data, forcing the crew to diagnose and correct problems using paper checklists that could be up to 15 centimeters or 6 inches thick. The time pressure mimicked in-flight demands, forging an unbreakable bond between astronauts and their procedures, a bond that would later prove vital during Apollo 13. Technical precision was not limited to switches and gauges. Visual realism was vital for effective training. Astronauts could not be prepared to dock in orbit or navigate in deep space using basic monitors. NASA deployed an ingenious electromechanical system called the Visual Display System. Imagine a large optical dome and mechanical track system housing scale models of space or lunar terrain below, not a literal sphere painted with stars. Inside these systems, high-end cameras, positioned by the flight computer, moved along three-dimensional models of the Earth, Moon, or docking targets. As the crew flew the simulated command module, these cameras transmitted moving images to screens on the window panels. When Collins practiced maneuvers like trans-Earth injection, he wasn't seeing computer graphics, but real footage produced by cameras moving over miniaturized sculpted terrain. The result was an astonishing depth of field and realism, demanding the same innate visual feel required in spaceflight. This system was essential for training Michael Collins in rendezvous and docking with Eagle, an operation requiring not only mathematics, but a visual mastery of closure rates and attitude changes. If the command module simulator represented complexity, the lunar module simulator, LMS, was the ultimate test. The lunar module, Eagle, was unique, stripped down, lightweight, and asymmetrical, weighing just over 15,000 kilograms, or 33,000 pounds, with a full landing load. The LMS focused on the most challenging phase of the mission, powered descent and landing. This is where Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin confronted their most critical trial. The LMS was an accurate fixed base replica of the lander's cockpit, equipped with motion cueing but not full hydraulic gimbals. Dynamic motion testing was performed separately in the lunar landing training vehicle. As the crew fired the thrusters in the simulator, Limited cues such as seat or visual motion feedback heightened realism, but the sense of motion was primarily conveyed through the external visuals and instrument response. Central to the LM's cockpit was the primary guidance and navigation system, PGNS, managed via the Apollo Guidance Computer, AGC, and controlled through the disk key keypad interface. Every program, verb noun entry, and button press had to be second nature. Engineers in the Mission Control Center, MCC, could trigger simulated software anomalies or alarms, like the infamous 1201 and 1202 warnings that, in flight, indicated computer CPU overload. Armstrong and Aldrin learned to distinguish between minor alerts and mission-critical failures, 
a distinction Armstrong and Aldrin would make under immense pressure during the real lunar landing. The most spectacular and demanding aspect of the LMS was the visual landing system. To train for landing on the harsh, cratered moon, NASA constructed vast, detailed scale models, some up to 36 meters, about 120 feet long, built to precise topographic standards. A gantry-mounted camera would descend toward the model, matched precisely to the simulated lunar trajectory. The resulting video feed was displayed inside the pilot's triangular window views. The effect? A convincing illusion of the lunar surface rushing up as the simulated eagle made its final approach. In the real lunar environment, blinding clouds of dust kicked up by the descent propulsion system generating about 45 kilonewtons 10,000 pounds of thrust could obscure vision just at touchdown. To replicate this window shade effect, the visual system's focus or clarity was progressively degraded in the final moments of simulated descent, forcing pilots to rely on instruments just as they would when flying blind in the real environment. The greatest challenge was not just perfecting operations in the command module or lunar module alone, but orchestrating a seamless integrated simulation. The integrated sim was a full mission rehearsal, synchronizing the CSM, the LSM, and consoles in Mission Control Center, MCC. Astronauts and flight controllers were joined together in real time, with massive computer networks running the complete eight-day sequence, from countdown to splashdown. These events, known as SIMS, began with the call, We Are Go For Launch. The legendary flight directors like Gene Krantz would preside over each session. The engineers orchestrating the simulation, known as Simulation Supervisors, or SIMSUPS, were masters of stress testing the system. Their job, inject catastrophic, unexpected failures until someone made a mistake. SIMSUP might introduce double failures, such as a CSM fuel cell loss, followed by loss of communications, demanding flawless troubleshooting and communication between crew and MCC under relentless time pressure. Armstrong once remarked the simulations were harder than the actual flight. The intent was clear. Test not just the astronauts, but the entire flight team to ensure they could respond to any threat, a real or imagined scenario. As the launch date approached, integrated SIMs focused on the most unforgiving 12 minutes in the flight plan, powered descent to the moon. Here, fuel margins disappeared and real-time judgment meant life or death. During Apollo 11, as Eagle descended, the computer aimed for an area marred by boulders, the West Crater. Armstrong had trained in the LMS to take semi-manual control, bypassing pre-programmed targets to fly laterally and find a safer site. Every meter, foot, off the automatic flight path came at the expense of fuel. Eagle carried propellant for about 120 seconds of hover time. 
In simulation after simulation, the crew rehearsed the critical 30-second fuel call. Mission Control's warning that if they had not landed or aborted within half a minute, fuel depletion was imminent. On July 20, 1969, as Eagle touched down on the Sea of Tranquility, that real 30 seconds call rang out. Armstrong, calm and precise, landed with roughly 16 to 20 seconds of fuel remaining, a tight but sufficient margin. The poise came from thousands of repetitions, facing simulated crisis until his responses were second nature. NASA's Apollo-era simulators were far more than training devices. They were the digital and mechanical foundation beneath every moment of confidence in flight. The engineering mastery on display was not just in the rocket or spacecraft design, but in the uncompromising preparation and simulation beneath every astronaut's calm exterior. The simulators replicated every system, every indicator, every possible failure between the Earth and the Moon, building not just skills, but mental resilience. They taught Armstrong to fly Eagle with unerring judgment. They taught Aldrin to interpret computer alarms with calm clarity. They taught Collins to maintain discipline as the solitary sentinel awaiting his crewmate's ascent. The Apollo 11 crew performed with a professionalism that continues to inspire because they had already rehearsed catastrophe thousands of times. The Saturn V provided the power. The Apollo spacecraft was the vehicle. But it was the simulators, the secret rehearsals, that forged the mastery and unshakable poise that brought a bold vision to reality. The moon landing was achieved not just by dreaming big, but by the rigorous, humble work of preparing for failure at every step. A legacy of mastery unlike any seen before or since.